right? And we haven't really addressed that. We haven't had the tools to address that per se. We've talked about robustness to initial conditions with regions of attraction and, and uh, <coughs> just even stabilizing controllers, but we haven't talked about robustness to disturbances and randomness, okay? And that's what we're gonna start to talk about today in the next few lectures. Now, um, you know I like dynamics. So actually we're gonna spend even the first of these lectures just thinking about the implications of having randomness flowing through your dynamics. And just like, I mean, if you think that the dynamics of a pendulum or, or some of our other simple systems are beautiful, then I think you'll see these are even more beautiful when you start having probability distributions fly around. Okay, so I mean, probability is the language of machine learning. So I think more and more people are very comfortable throwing around uh, probability, terms from probability, you know, but it's very easily, easy to talk about um, throwing a max entropy objective or something in without really thinking through, I think, the implications that it has on the dynamical system. So by the end of the lecture, I hope you'll understand a little bit or have some more, build your intuition about what, what can happen in nonlinear dynamical systems when you have probabilities flying around. So, so far, Throughout the class, we've basically been working with um, you know, systems of the form, maybe they're time dependent or whatever, uh, but or we've been working with discrete time systems of the form And the big question is, you know these are the deterministic models. ordinary differential or difference equations. And the question is, what does the stochastic version of this look like? Do we have to throw out everything we've, we've learned and start over with a completely new notation? And of course, there's some ways that changing our notation will expose some of the beauty of the, of the probability <coughs> um, world, but with actually very minor change to this, we can already take all of our systems that we've been working with and start thinking about the stochastic equivalent of them. So basically we're gonna start thinking about our systems but having some exogenous random, a random input. You could think of that as a, as a disturbance when, when it's a, when the randomness is coming into the state equations, we think of that as a disturbance or process noise. Might be another name for it. I just distinguish that from measurement or observation noise, which would happen maybe in the, the output equations, but not in the state equations. And of course, there's a discrete time equivalent of that. Okay, <clears throat> and then all of the work about defining random processes is gonna be deferred to the, the way we define this random input. It still has a huge impact on what happens to X, okay, and that's what we wanna define, but even in the, just in the, in the code, for instance, like you're, you're not gonna completely throw out what you've done, you still got, if you want a physics engine or something, all you're doing is you're adding a, random, a new input port and all of the random process work is coming in right through that input port. And this is a picture that has grown up in the world of robust control. For instance, you've often see diagrams that have our, our input, our output, and then this extra input W, okay? And oftentimes there's some performance output or whatever, and you'll see one set of tools for reasoning about W and a different set of tools for thinking about the total controller, okay? And we'll develop that in the next few lectures. But that's kind of the picture is, it's just another input port. The system that generates this random input is interesting and it must be done carefully when you're in the world of numerics, but for, for our modeling purposes, we're gonna go like this. Now that's a extremely general form in terms, you know, in, even in terms of the code, we tend to only support a handful of the canonical random processes. Just say I've got a 
uh, mean zero white noise Gaussian process, or there's a, just a, you know, a handful of the standard distributions here. But even if I just say I've got a Gaussians coming in, because I can do arbitrary things in F, then I can quickly change a Gaussian into sort of, I can reshape it into much more interesting distributions by multiplying it by whatever I want, for instance. And by the time it in, in, interacts with the dynamic equations, this is a very, very general notion, even if the randomness comes in in simple forms. A special case of this, which we'll do um, a few times when it's useful, would be to talk about additive random noise. Okay, There's some cases where that becomes easier to reason about and more tractable, and we'll call that out when we need to. Now I'll spend more of the, I'll spend the lecture today trying to stay basically in discrete time, just because I, it, I don't, you can certainly uh, define continuous time random processes. That's not hard to do, but the, uh, it takes more notation and the like. Having a, a, this be something that's just drawn at, at discrete times drawn by a, from a random number generator is just easier notationally and easier to think about. So we'll stay mostly in discrete time today. Okay, so let's just think about, um, you know, a very basic example of, of a random process that's kind of a dynamical system. And I, I like to think of these things with physical interpretations, even though the equations are simple state space equations. Let's say a particle in a bowl subject to Brownian motion. Okay, so think about if I've got some, some potential field, I'll call it U of X, okay? Just, just a bowl, and I want to write the dynamics of some ball that's rolling in the bowl. And if it was a deterministic thing and it was first order, it might just roll to the bottom, but we're gonna also add some random noise. So this is gonna be bouncing around a little bit, but, and governed by two dynamics, the dynamics of rolling down the bowl and also some random process. Okay, so if I do the simplest potential function, if I just chose one half alpha x squared, for instance, just a quadratic form, then the dynamics I might write of this, if I think of this as a potential flow, I'd say that the, the dynamics are going to use the gradient of that. Okay, so which is alpha x, and I might say that the dynamics of x in continuous time would be something like I'm going to go downhill on the gradient. Simple linear dynamics. And if I wanted a discrete time approximation of that. I could get that just with the uh, Euler approximation. And then to make it more interesting, we'll start adding noise, okay? Okay, first order linear dynamics, but now with a stochastic in, uh, exogenous input. So when, when W is zero here, we know a lot about this, right? In particular, since it's linear, we can just roll that out. We can look at the long-term dynamics. We can say that Xn is just one minus alpha to the nth power times whatever the initial condition is. And we know then that that's gonna either blow up or it's going to go to zero and the condition of, is just that alpha has got to be between zero and two. More interesting now is if we start to think about what happens when we add the randomness in. So <clears throat> let's add the simplest most common form. This is an additive noise. We'll do, let's say, 
Wn is a mean zero Gaussian white noise. This implies that the system is IID, independent, identically independently distributed, or some permutation of those words, independently identically. And uh, it just says that W at time n is independent from W at time n plus 1, or the, all the other n's. Right? So there's no correlations in time. So this, if I start using the language of the expected value here, I'm going to say that the mean of this value is zero, right? This is the expected value, the mean. You won't need uh, heavy probability and statistics to follow this. Just We're just going to use the basics. And this is saying that Random variables have a, a standard deviation of sigma, right? Uh, but they're otherwise they're uncorrelated over time. That'd be kind of the simplest random input we could put into the system. So the question is: We said we understand the stability of the system when alpha, you know, when w is zero, what can we say about the stability of the system with this input? Does x go to zero as time goes to infinity? No. Okay, right, so why not, just to spell it, spell it out? Yeah, so good. So, so asymptotically, if we say the limit as time goes to infinity, it has to be at zero. If, even if it arrives at zero at some point, the next very next step, it won't be at zero anymore necessarily. It's high probability it won't be at zero, right? And uh, um, so, so our standard definitions of stability don't, don't hold, okay? But the distribution of this, actually, if you think about the, you know, so if you think about any one particular trace of this, it's going to, um, you know, any one marble subject to Brownian motion is going to kind of move down. It's going to bounce around a little bit. It'll bounce around the bottom here. The interesting thing is that the stability we want is not on the rollout of one particular marble, let's say. It's the distribution that, has, that takes on the nice values, okay? So even though the, um, you know, what this means is if I put a random variable into my equations and I push it through, now x of n is a random variable. It will not converge in this in a stability, but we can ask the probability of x of n, and I'm going to write that as the probability at the nth step is the probability distribution of x at step n. What's interesting is that even though this is badly behaved, the probability distribution can be very nicely behaved. Okay, we'll, we'll come back and look at that first, but let me just give you some pictures here first. It's actually even more interesting, I think to pick slightly richer functions. So if I do, for instance, if I did my, um, my cubic polynomial that you know I love, that's actually equivalent to choosing u of x being um, negative 1 half x squared plus 1 quarter x to the fourth. I have my 
probability function, my potential function like this. Okay, and if I put a marble on this and I take the gradient, then it gives me the, the equations that I love, which are x minus x cubed, like we've always used for sums of squares and the like, right? If I add in, if I take the discrete time approximation of that now, and I add some noise, then what is that system going to do? Okay, it's actually pretty interesting. I made a little animation of it. Okay, so if I start it with, so this is my, the, you understand that the potential field is this, but the, when I, once I take the gradient, the dynamics looks like the cubic function. Okay, <clears throat> so if I take an initial set of, of configurations, remember this has got <clears throat> a stable fixed point here, a stable fixed point somewhere here, wherever it crosses zero, and an unstable fixed point around the origin. If I start a lot of marbles at the origin, and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just plot a histogram of different, of a random rollouts, okay? Then what do we think is gonna happen here? As I add randomness, I'm gonna get probability mass around the two fixed points, right? Does that make sense? And even though every, one, every individual rollout is random, it's a random variable and it's bouncing all over the place and it's not converging stably, the distribution <coughs> actually is beautifully behaved and converges stably. It's hard, you know, I'm just simulating it with a, a small number, a relatively small number of samples, but the true distribution actually stabilizes beautifully. And that's an interesting example because this is also uh, an example of finite time escape, okay? So people talk about these types of systems where, um, you know, you get a marble here and most of the time it starts moving down towards this basin, which is towards that fixed point. But there's some amount of probability that it'll actually move up. So even though the, the probability stabilizes, it's actually the result of a pretty complicated process where even at steady state, I have some particles that will, with some probability, eventually jump up and come over here, and some other ones that'll jump up and go over there, right? Maybe it takes a bunch of random Gaussians, that, you know, Gaussian noise in a, in a bunch of different steps to finally accumulate enough energy to, to make an escape attempt and hop over to the other side, okay? But the individual trajectories of this can be very complicated. The distribution can be beautiful. Okay, so we're going to talk about the dynamics of the probability of n, and we'll write the dynamics. You know, we'll, we can take our state space dynamics and write them instead in the rules of probability. Okay, where this is sort of an alternative description of my f of x u w here. I didn't write a u here yet, but f of x and w. I can write it as a conditional probability saying, given I have, I'm at some state, <coughs> what's the probability of being at the next state? Those are equivalent descriptions. This one is the state space form, that's the probability form. <clears throat> and so the new object of study is the, is the dynamics of this probability distribution. And this equation goes by many names. Some people call it the master equation. I guess that's probably a, out of fashion these days. But continuous state Markov processes. If I start putting a U in, you get a Markov, continuous state Markov decision process. It's closely related to the perron frobenius theorems and Walker Planck theorem uh, equations, and there's lots of words that people use for, for very similar ideas. But the idea is basically let's write the dynamics of the probability distribution. <clears throat> is that setup kind of clear? Yeah. Uh, I might be missing something, but so for the fixed point on the right, the main graph, is it unstable or is it just a huge probability from the right there? 
Yep, so let's just, let's just do it carefully here. So the, I'm sorry to be as far as possible angle-wise from you who asked the question, but it looks like this, right? So I get a stable fixed point here, an unstable fixed point here, a stable fixed point here. Yep, so the probability mass, I started the probability here. After one step, it had a random, it had a Gaussian, and then it will walk towards the two stable fixed points. Thank you for asking that, yeah. This is the potential, because I think that has a graphical you know, intuition, but this is the dynamics. Yes? Um, I think it's that random motion around the block. Have you really sort of like had to kind of figure out exactly what it is? Yep. I mean, it's, it, it was first of uh, experimental observation that small um, bacteria first, and then in molecules, you know, they, they, that they have motion that appears to be random, okay? So it was actually just an experimental name for, uh, for this, but it has come to mean uh, particles subject to small random motion, and that's all I'm using here. It turns out that actually, <clears throat> um, even, if the, even if you don't have random process noise, even when w equals zero, sometimes the rules of prob looking at things through the lens of probability can be useful even for deterministic dynamical systems. Okay, so I, I get, have to give you my favorite example of this. <clears throat> particularly true for chaotic systems, for instance. This is a canonical chaotic system. system, a nonlinear dynamics considered to exhibit chaos if very small changes in initial conditions can lead to very uh, different rollouts. That's the sort of the definition of chaos is, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings and, and across the globe and we get a, a storm here or a gas leak, I guess. Okay, so um, the, the logistic Mac map is a simple discrete dynamical system, discrete time dynamical system. It's easy to draw pictorially as it's defined over the interval of zero to one. Okay, it's just a, a tent map. They also sometimes feel, people call it the tent map. And if you remember our, when we played with discrete time um, systems, the graphical analysis, we've, what matters is the relationship between the, the function and the line of slope one. And <clears throat> when you wanna study these, one of the ways you can sort of simulate it on the board here would be I'm gonna take some initial condition, I'm gonna see where it, what it's gonna be at xn plus one. So I have xn is here, what's xn plus one? And then the way I can sort of map it back to this axis is I project myself to the, um, to the line of slope one, and then I go up here, project myself to the line of slope one, okay? And what's interesting is that this thing can go crazy really fast, okay? Suddenly you're over here, you're over here, you're over here, okay? And you can very quickly bounce all over the map. And a very small change in initial condition can take you a very different path around the map. So the rollouts of this, if you just plot trajectories, will just be bouncing all over the place, okay? Even though it's a simple polynomial dynamics and, you know, it, but it exhibits chaos. Yes? Does the logistic map exhibit the same behavior in linear time? Uh, you just have to be careful about it, but I would think, I mean, <clears throat> this is a fundamentally sort of discrete time thing. We'd have to figure out what the logistic map means in continuous time. Like the, the limit as we took that yeah, I don't know. We'd have to write it down. What's amazing, though, is that you take that map, 
and you plot, if, if you were to say, I'm going to start with a uniform probability over all, over the interval 0, 1, and I'm going to ask, how does the, how does the governing equations, how does that probability distribution evolve as I push it through the map? This is one of the simple places where we can actually do that in closed form. And even though the rollouts of the, of the system are completely crazy, the, the propagation of the probability density is extremely simple. This is the uniform distribution over the interval 0, 1. After one step, it looks like this. We can actually do it in closed form in this case. Okay. After two steps, it looks like this. And this dashed orange line is actually the, the fixed point. It will, that distribution will converge to a fixed point. A fixed point of the probability distribution is called the steady state distribution. Okay. Right, so individual rollouts are crazy, but the, um, but the statistics are beautiful. Anybody um, big science fiction fan? A little bit, a little bit, a few. I love Asimov. I love a, a lot of science fiction, but I love Asimov. Every time I think about this, I think about the Foundation series. Anybody know why I think about the Foundation series for this? Yeah. Yeah, Harry Seldon. Yeah. Exactly. But but the, the point was, right, he had this notion of psychohistory, and he, and it, it was like the plot line throughout the entire series was that you can't predict any individual's rollout. Okay. But, you know, the laws of statistics still apply to large groups of people and is very much it can be used to predict the future flow of events, right? So, so all of the like plot twists were like there was someone who was an anomaly that was like an, an individual that couldn't have been predicted by the laws that then screwed everything up and then they had to fix the prime radiant and go back, you know. But, um, but it's beautiful. It's true. I think that 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 sometimes even though, our, you know, as individuals we're incredibly crazy or or individual rollouts of our dynamical systems can be crazy, the distributions are actually. Uh, the right object to study. Okay, so <clears throat> there's kind of a basic lesson of what's, what's happening with the forces of randomness and the forces of deterministic stability. I just want to make sure I, I show you that in the, and I can show you that in this, in this really simple example of this linear system. Okay. So if I have my standard, this analysis works for in higher dimensions too, but I'll just keep it in as a scalar system because I can write less on the board. Okay. And I'll say that WN is drawn from um, some distribution over W that is a Gaussian, right? I'd like to write is the dynamics, <coughs> the probability of x conditioned on x prime. So I'll, I'll just write it out like this. Slight abusive notation, maybe, but I think it's clearer to write to call my conditioned variable x. What's the probability over the next variable? This is also going to be a Gaussian. It's going to be centered on a xn and have this sigma squared. Okay, so this is my mean, my notation here. This is the mean, this is the variance for my Gaussian. Okay, so if I have, if I know what x is at a time n and I want to know the probability distribution over xn plus 1, then I know I'm going to have a Gaussian, okay, where the mean is at the deterministic dynamics. 
and the variance is coming from the noise. And the question is, what happens as to p n of x as n goes to infinity? And it turns out that we can solve this in, in closed form. Pn, um, this converges to a distribution n0. And this is, we'll call it sigma squared star, the steady state. This is just the just the same thing you saw in my animation, right? This is the, the probability is going to con converge to a Gaussian. It's going to be around zero. And the interesting thing is, what is the variance at the steady state? OK. And it turns out, let me call this omega, this sigma w here. It turns out that sigma star squared is sigma w squared. 1 minus a squared. OK, so I can, in closed form, this is not, um, this is you know, a special case where we can solve it in closed form. It's an it's a important case. It works for any linear Gaussian. In fact, if you know Kalman filters, this is just the Kalman filter in, um, innovation, or not innovation, the, the process equation in the Kalman filter. OK, and this would be the steady state gains of the, the steady state distribution of the Kalman filter, for instance. But what I want you to see is that there are two forces at play. It's intuitive, but it shows up beautifully in the symbols here. OK, the distribution, if you have more noise, if I have a higher variance noise coming in, that's going to increase the variance of my steady state distribution. OK, but if I'm more stable, OK, if, if alpha is going up, yeah, then I'm, well, it's, if it's, it's um, you know, it makes, the alpha will fight against the, the randomness. Okay, so there's two forces. Stability is trying to bring things towards the origin. Randomness is trying to pull, pull, push it out. And it's when these things balance that you get your stationary distribution. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, A has to be between negative one and one. So exactly, so in fact, right, so that's exactly, so this thing would, would blow up if A became 1 or negative 1, right? Can't you imagine the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues of the process could be imaginary, but the dynamical system, we wouldn't think of that as, as being imaginary. We want the, this is the description of a, you know, real valued system. Yeah, if you had, a, if you had, Multiple dimensions, you could have multiple eigenvalues which had uh, complex parts. Yeah. So in the, all the examples we've considered, it's never been possible for trajectories to blow up towards infinity because they're not finding the norm. Uh, do you use these models of looking at the probabilistic distribution and the chance that trajectories diverge? Um, absolutely. Yeah. So so I, I, so um, you can ask what happens to the to the stationary distribution. One of the things that can happen to the stationary distribution is that you can lose probability off into infinity. In fact, I've got that as an example coming up here. If you were to do, if you were to take this system, for instance, and flip it upside down, let's take the other cubic polynomial. I'll call it the time reversed. I'm just going to flip the sign. So I had x dot, yeah, so now I want x dot equals negative x plus x cubed. So my dynamics are going to look more like this, where I have on, on this side. So now I'm going to be coming up, down like this. So now I have a stable fixed point here and unstable fixed points here. Okay, if I make my discrete time approximation of that, so I can think about simulating it. With Gaussian random noise, 
then what does that system do? Okay. What's the stationary distribution of this? That's what? Okay. Here we go. It's like a balloon that you pop and pss, you're slowly losing probability. Okay, so it starts exactly what you said. It starts as a Gaussian in the middle. But any time, any trajectory that sort of gets past that hump is likely to keep rolling, you know, is keep, keep going this way, right? It's actually that the hump is, um, it's, it's a hump here, right? So it has to get past this fixed point and then suddenly it will diverge. Okay, so there's probability mass at infinity and negative infinity that's getting bigger as the probability mass in the bottom goes to zero. So the probability at the, uh, you know, the, the stationary distribution, if you choose to define it, people have, you can, you can be careful about these things, yeah, but roughly the, all of the probability mass is going to be at a positive or negative infinity as time goes to, in, to infinity. So this thing slowly decays. Yeah? Is this ever, can you ever, like, say you just did a bump sharp enough to the way that you make it stable enough that it'll, it will have some kind of time intervention? So, so that's a really important question, right? So can, so how would I make the system sort of sharp enough, stable enough that I do have um, guaranteed, you know, I have probability that stays at the origin? Gaussian random noise, right, with infinite tails will escape no matter what you give it, right? So asking for a, a system, most systems subjected to Gaussian noise, if you ask them to have a guarantee of robustness or stability, it will, the system will just be, say no, you can't, you can't achieve that. If you talk about bounded noise, then you can start getting into places where you have absolute, you have probability mass as time goes to infinity. And that's one of the big lessons here is that the type of noise you put in is gonna give, govern these dynamics and it's gonna change what you can ask for. This is actually a famous sort of example. I mean, it's my cubic polynomial version of the same famous idea of metastability. People talk about metastable systems. Which is roughly, I mean, <clears throat> this is a system which, uh, where the stationary distribution is, only, is, is, is one thing, but there's actually a very long living transient, okay? People say that diamonds are metastable. They will eventually, with some probability, turn into coal. Okay, but for all intents and purposes, they're gonna be a diamond for a very long time. Okay, in the same, same way here, we can change the, if I change the variance of the noise, I could make that hang out for a long time in the origin. It would be more annoying to watch it on the screen, but we could have something that looked like it was stable, but just very slowly decayed, right? And in some cases, We'll see actually, I think for walking robots, for instance, that's actually a fairly reasonable uh, model of what's happening in the system. I think with some high probability, with some probability, some low probability, eventually your walking robot will fall over. You know, you're gonna trip over a banana peel or, you know, get hit by a truck or I don't know. You know there's, if you're really modeling everything that could happen in the world, something will eventually knock you over. So guarantees that say with 100% probability are pretty optimistic, right? Autonomous cars, Asking for an autonomous car to have to never crash is too much, right? If you, it means you haven't made a rich enough model of the world, okay? But what you hope for is that for a long time and with very high probability, you know, after, for, for long rollouts, we're gonna be stable. Okay, so this notion of metastability is actually really important. From the standpoint of a roboticist, then how much do we actually care about atomic cost behavior versus non-atomic behavior? Because this is something that we totally can calculate. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, this is, and uh, so, so the question was, how much should we care about asymptotic behavior versus a finite sample, if you will, behavior? I, I would say there's a, there's a big trend in theory to go back through. I think asymptotic behavior is easier to analyze often, and we did a lot of that for a long time. I think machine learning has actually been bringing in a lot of new tools and finite sample bounds on all these kind of processes. And so we're revisiting a lot of them with, with finite sample measure, uh, 
viewpoints. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm adding Gaussian ran, uh, additive noise here. Okay, there are different ways to add noise. If I were to, for instance, move the the, I'm just going to repeat the question mostly, but um, if I were to move the function up and down, then that could have a very different stability properties. We actually, do you remember the figures? I actually, it was, a, it was a figure of this where I was adding up and down, and I was doing multiplicative noise, different noise, when we talked about common Lyapunov functions. For the places where we could find a common Lyapunov function, it was because exactly what you say. There are cases where I could move the function up and down and still guarantee that there was, that it wouldn't go off the rails. I still had a, uh, a guarantee that over some possibly smaller region, I was guaranteed to converge to the fixed point. But additive random noise that's unbounded tends to, tends to blow up eventually. Yeah, if I had something that was stable on the outsides and, or, you know, um, it's, then it can be it can be better, um, or if I have bounded noise, it, all of these things are different cases and deserve their own attention. Yeah. Just trying to tie it together. If instead of Brownian motion, um, you looked at if you were looking at one particle here in a gas, and you just considered the collision to be now you're imparting momentum rather than what some of the positions say. How does that sort of theory work? Uh, okay, so. Um, right, so I think the, the, the beginnings of like statistical mechanics as a way to think about gas laws and, and thermodynamics, right? I guess that was Maxwell that somehow made the leap of going from deterministic models of these things to statistical models. I think that's a little bit like the chaos case where the, the complexity is real, it's there, but even if you thought of the system as being completely deterministic, it can be summarized more efficiently as with, a, with statistics, right? All of the complexity, you know, all of those individual molecules are doing are doing simple things, or you know, doing random, you know, doing complex things, and it's easier to think about them in, in bulk as random and writing the, the process, uh, the, the dynamics of the of the distribution, right? So so it would be, so, I mean, how would we want to think about that, right? So I think if we had an x for every particle, right, some huge vector for instance, then the way that evolved, it would depend very much on the initial conditions of all those x's. They would collide with different particles or not, okay? But the law of the distribution of that could be very simple. I guess I was trying to think about if, you, if your system is one particle and the impacts are just noise, but they impart velocity rather than imparting a position, it, right? Instead of, I guess it would be the, the next higher order system than that that has velocity. Okay. It still works. The pictures are, this, are higher dimensional, but they still work, for sure. Yeah. But maybe I mean the, the I got a two-dimensional one. It's not, uh, but a two-dimensional one next, right? So here's the Vanderpool oscillator, for instance, right? Imagine I've got some initial distribution, and I just add Gaussian noise to my otherwise simple polynomial equations that would have gone around in a limit cycle. So what's this going to do? So this is just additive Gaussian noise to the Van der Poel oscillator. What would you expect that distribution to do? So we have we have kind of a deterministic vector fields pushing it in oh, right. towards the limit cycle and or spiraling out, and we have noise trying to push it out. So the question is, where does it balance and how does it balance, right? It spreads out. Okay, let's see. Like I, I think this is beautiful, but you guys can have your own opinion. Okay. Right, the way it sort of marches through the system. It almost looks alive. Right. Okay. So, again, there's there's competing forces. There's the stability to the cycle. But there's also, um, remember the stability is a limit cycle stability. It doesn't actually, it isn't stable along the cycle. 
So any randomness that happened to push it to a different place in phase will never be recovered. And that's why it spreads out along the, the orbit. And if I were to, I let it go for a while here, but I fast forwarded to the something at, you know, time equals a thousand or something, and you get something more like that, right? Exactly because there's no stability along the orbit. All right. Yes? Is there like a variation in density along the way based on how fast it's going through the trajectory? Yeah, yeah. You can see it a little bit here. It kind of wells up in the corners, I, th I think. Um, yeah, there's a couple of regions that I think are higher, that tend to be higher density, yes. Exactly based on velocity. Okay, so um, we gave the basic idea. We've sort of talked about two possible sources of randomness so far. We talked about the random input, which is a random process W. The other one that we've kind of been alluding to and I used in some of these plots is you could have a, a random initial conditions, right? So you could have probability of N, or probability zero of X it might not be a, um, a single point. It could, it could be a distribution. But there's, you know, there's only a handful of different ways that you can think about randomness or you need to think about randomness in, this, in these systems um, and try to think about it hard in when we we're architecting you know, the randomness through Drake and, and stuff like this. So we've pretty much captured most of them. So the systems can have random parameters, okay? You can have random initial conditions and you can have random inputs. And that captures 90% maybe more of the systems you ever want to model with randomness. And <clears throat> what's important is you always make f deterministic as a function of distributions of its inputs. And that gives us all kinds of um, power, for instance, um, well, for, for robust control and robust analysis, if you want to design a Kalman filter, you can just analyze these equations, take gradients of f, and that's exactly what you need to design a Kalman filter, okay? But moreover, if you just are trying to make interesting random simulations, for instance, it has the nice property that everything is, uh, you can r roll out random rollouts, but everything is always deterministic based on the random seed, okay? So if I just lock the random seed, then I get exactly the same random rollout twice. So for you know, building really complicated robots and, and uh, you know, you, you've run all kinds of random simulations, you found something that broke your code in some crazy way, you can always get exactly back to the repeatable initial condition and run that exact ex experiment again. That's a luxury of simulation that we don't have in the real world, right? Robots never act the same way twice, unfortunately. And the other, there's, a, there's, a, there's only a handful of different concepts. You can set random parameters, set random state. The most complicated is if you actually you know, if you have like a different number of links in your robot or a different number of objects in the scene, then there's a, there's a mechanism for that too, okay? But it's all pretty carefully crafted and so that you can do rigorous analysis and design in the systems framework. Okay. Um, I gave you, all the systems I've talked about so far have been smooth. It's actually really interesting to think about what happens when you have randomness come into contact, right? So we've talked about contact mechanics, talked about walking robots and all these things. So what happens, what do these distributions tend to look like when you look at contact? You can come up with all kinds of little thought experiments, but for instance, imagine I just had a, a ball here and it's falling subject to gravity. Maybe it's got random initial conditions in X, but it's, there's some corner it's gonna fall on, right? And I, I could easily imagine you know, a probability distribution that would end up on the floor over here and the, on the floor over here, right? But no probability mass in the center, okay? So lots of interesting things can happen with contact. But there's a specific thing that sort of happens when you start reasoning about probabilities and contact that I want you to, to see. Okay, so um, 
Let me do a very simple example here. Imagine I've got um, just a simple block M here, and I've got a wall here. I'll call Q the position of the box relative to the wall. And let's say I try to subject that to Brownian motion. Okay, what does that mean? So it's going to bounce around a little bit, but any reasonable model of, of contact, it wouldn't, it wouldn't let you go into the wall, right? So most simulators, most models of contact would say that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do what you're going to do, but any part of your distribution, any randomness that would have taken you into the wall is going to be projected back to the wall. If you remember the, the time-stepping linear complementarity problem that we had you think about on the problem set, that's exactly what this, that system would do. It would say that I'm going to, any trajectories that would have gone into here are going to get projected back to the wall. Okay, so let's just think about what, what that does to the equations. Okay, so here's my, my picture. This is actually an example from Terry and Peng's recent paper. Okay, so the probability distribution, if I just said I've, I've got Q at the next step is just my, my current Q plus some randomness, but I project it back to the wall, then I'm going to get a probability distribution after one step that looks something like that. Right? So there's going to be a lot of probability mass on the wall, but otherwise it's like the tail of the Gaussian was just turned into that one delta function. Okay. But what's really interesting is that if you think about the deterministic dynamics of this, if I were to just plot, if I said the dynamics was Q of n plus 1 is just Q of n, plus Wn, okay, well, sorry, I should say it more carefully, if Q of n plus Wn greater than equal to zero, otherwise it's zero, otherwise, then that function, if I were to plot it as a function of, if I to plot Q n plus one as a function of q, and that function, when w equals 0, looks like this, okay? For, for w equals 0, that's just the rectified linear unit if you're a neural network person, right? It's going to be a discontinuous, it's a continuous non-smooth function, right, that looks, has two parts. Q of n was negative, it gets projected back to zero at n plus one. Now, some of you have been having fun asking Snopped, for instance, to play with functions that look like this when you make and break contacts, right? And Snopped isn't super happy when you do that, in part because the gradient of that function, right, is actually discontinuous. If I were to plot, if I called this, um, f of q, right, then the, the plot of q versus partial f partial q, which is the gradients that Snopped is using, it looks like this function here. Okay, what happens when you add randomness to the, to the, um, to the process? Suddenly, the deterministic dynamics, which were non-smooth, give you now, if I plot the expected value of the next step, it actually has a beautiful, smooth, rounding effect on the discontinuous, or the non-smooth dynamics. Does that make sense? So the, the probability of, when I'm, when I'm far from the wall, then the probability is, the expected value is just gonna be like a Gaussian, so I'm just at Q. So it lines up with the line of slope one. When I'm deep into the wall, all of the probability mass goes to zero. But as I'm, as I'm moving this way, then you know, it's gradually transitioning from there to there. Yeah? It's, so it's a little weird. So, so it probably make more sense if I pl pl did Q plus U plus W. So you could think of like someone was pushing me or whatever, but I tried to keep it on just one axis. So, I, so it's really like I'm, I was sitting here and then I got subjected to some random noise 
but the world pushed me back if I went into the wall. So it's like the particle just being bounced around but can't bounce into the wall. Okay. And what that means is that the dynamics here look smoother. If you looked at the probability of where I'd be on the next step, it's going to be now a smooth function, the expected value of that probability. And what's even cooler is if you look at the gradients, right, those become nice too. Right? So this discontinuous gradient that you had in the deterministic problem actually has a nice smoothed gradient in the expected value. So there's been a line of work now. Um, you know, this is one of them uh, trying to understand whether the randomness that people add in reinforcement learning, for instance, has, a, a, has this smoothing effect on the contact dynamics and might actually be making the optimization landscape, which some of our problems write down as very discontinuous, becomes a lot smoother. And maybe that's partly why RL has done a better job through contact than some of our, our fully deterministic optimizations. If I were to run out, um, roll out n different simulations, and then take the average of where it is on each, uh, well, uh, this, is, this is really n different one-step simulations. This is the one-step dynamics, okay? Then this is what, where it's gonna be. If I started here, then the average would be there. I could, I could roll this forward and come up with the, the long-term dynamics if we wanted to. Okay, I guess it'll be pushed away from the wall a, a little bit. But this is, the, this is saying, on average, every time I started here, if I took the random value a bunch of times, it's going to end up there. I didn't say that well enough for you. I'm also looking into the light. The expected value of one step, after one step. Yeah? Um, I missed the key part as to why it goes behind the, the wall. It doesn't go behind the wall. Okay, good. So well, let's do it on this so I don't have to look in the light. So when, if I started, so the, the way I've written the process down here, um, if Q ever got itself into the wall, I'm going to say on the next step it was projected back to the wall. Okay? That has the impact, the, the effect that it will never actually be in the wall. All right. When W is zero first, which is what I plotted here first, then that's saying that if you ever found yourself in the wall, which would be Q of N being negative, then on the very next step you're at the wall. Q N is zero. That's what this curve is. And this is saying if on, at N you were outside the wall, then you're just gonna be exactly where you were. That's the two pieces of the curve. Now on average it's saying if I was in the wall, I'm, you know, if I was deep in the wall, then I'm probably just gonna be on the wall. I need one more piece of chalk here. Okay, but if I was deep in the wall and getting a little closer to the wall, then on average I'll be not exactly on the wall, but a little bit pushed out. Okay, and the farther I go from the wall, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna if I, even if I was in penetration on this step, on average, once I add W back in, I'm gonna be outside the wall, not exactly on the wall. Because some of the Ws pushed me all the way out, some of them just got projected here. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I really do, I've, said, I've actually, we, I think we've made more progress in understanding it. The field has made more progress in understanding it in the last few years. But this is something that I've been saying for a long time, which is that the stochastic dynamics can be easier to optimize than the deterministic ones. We've seen stochastic trajectory optimization that sometimes has less quirks than deterministic trajectory optimization. It's like with, you know, you can have, Things that would happen to a deterministic system just kind of wash away. They wouldn't happen if the world is slightly random. Sorry. Um, thanks for some inconsistence for why, like, when you were at zero, this is 
Okay, so there's a couple points there. So first of all, the, what, the what the optimizer needs to handle is probably the gradients. Yeah. So it's, you we're probably handing it something that's actually discontinuous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is certainly a nicer function to hand the optimizer. Okay, it's a different function. It's a, we've defined a different dynamical system. It has force at a distance, for instance, right? So you could be, so, so it is a, you, you have changed your objective you're not going to get the, it's not an exact replacement to the original problem, okay? But it's certainly a smoother function that you could potentially optimize over. Is that what you're saying? No. Um, well, yes, but like some smoothing wouldn't be productive because I feel like it would be spurious gradients. Like if instead you decided to smooth and you went like this, yep. then you'd get gradients that wouldn't make sense for your hinge dynamic. Absolutely. So is it always a property that when you do this, okay, this is a better question. Do, is it always, when you do this, you get gradients that make Got it. Right. So you can come up with um, original. So it really, um, if you roll this out to longer term, you can imagine, I should have included maybe some of those pictures, but you can look at the long-term gradients and they can be discontinuous. And this really has like a smoothing effect, a randomized smoothing, of, they call it, uh, effect on the, the long-term landscape. Okay. You're absolutely right. Not only can it change the, the, the minima, it can do the wrong thing in cases. Like if you had a very high frequency thing and it smooths it out, that might actually, you might have missed a signal that you cared about, right? And you can come up with examples in either case. So yeah, I don't think it's obviously always better, but I think some of the foibles that we associate with contact are certainly, you know, those disappear and you give yourselves a slightly different problem. Great, yeah. Yeah, so okay, so, so I should, if we, when we think about specifically about contact, once we saw this, we realized, okay, you could actually do that deterministically too. In fact, we were doing it deterministically in some of the earlier papers too. So you can hit, give yourself force at a distance and get sort of similarly smooth. You don't actually need to use randomness to achieve a curve like this. You can just make a different contact model that looks like this. Yeah, and then in, those, in both the random context and in the uh, deterministic smoothing, it's often a nice thing to start with a very smooth system, and then as you get closer to optimization, you crank, you know, you reduce the, the force at a distance penalty because that's non-physical, and you can hope that it, it helps, it kind of gives a curriculum, if you will, to the solver to get to, into the right solution. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, let me tell you about one more cool walking example, which again, is, is designed to be sim as simple as possible, to, but to be interesting, okay? And this is now the rimless wheel um, rolling on rough terrain, okay? Remember I said the rimless wheel was like the one system that we could actually analyze the, the return map and completely understand all of the possible solutions. So what we're gonna do now, you remember the return map of the, um, of the rimless wheel was a function of the ramp angle. Okay, so if we're gonna draw some random terrain, then, um, then really the dynamics are just the same dynamics we already analyzed, but we're gonna say we're gonna pick the, ran the, the ramp angle on each step from some, let's say, Gaussian random variable. That's a very different way to think about it. It's not pushing it or whatever, but it's just the ramp angle that comes out of a random, um, uh, out of the Gaussian random variables, okay? And then you can just, plot, since it doesn't matter what the leg does in between, you can just plot between those random angles you picked, um, you know, arbitrary curves to make it look like you're doing something impressive. Okay, so then what's the probability, what's the dynamics of that probability distribution, right? If I started with some, some distribution around the nominal rolling fixed point, then what does this do? Okay, so think about that for a second. I'll start drawing what the return maps look like again. Mm 
When I drew the return map the first time, we chose the return map from just when the foot was leaving the ground until when it came back around and was about to leave the ground again. That's a harder place to do it because that's going to be different on every step. So we could just e equally well choose the apex. So every time the rimless wheel goes over the top, we'll call the return map at that point too. And then we were insensitive to the, to the location of the terrain and the plot. Okay, so so now if I plot theta dot of the rimless wheel on the nth step versus theta dot at the n plus one step from the apex return map, then I get a curve that looks something like this, where the line of slope one is still important in these maps. And I get a rolling fixed point that looks like this. Okay, that's the deterministic rimless wheel return map on the apex. It looks something like that. When we start saying now that the, um, the ramp angle is chosen on each step as a Gaussian random variable, then the picture you should have in your head, I think, is that for any theta dot n, the next theta dot n, the mean is going to be, you know, let's say my nominal deterministic one, but there's an entire distribution of possible next ramp angles. Is that okay for me to draw it like that? Like at, at, at any place that I evaluate this, I'm going to draw from a, dis a distribution to get a, my random return map. And what's really interesting is the kind of things that can happen on this now random return map, okay? This is that exact same thing. And this is the distribution, the same way I did the histogram of, possible, of many possible rollouts. And you can see from many different initial conditions it converges to this nice distribution around the rolling fixed point. Okay, but what, what's hard to see here? What, what else is happening? Can we make it wobble? Right. This is just like the balloon that's slowly losing energy, right? Because off the end of this return map, for instance, that means you actually don't re revisit the map. You could, at some, with some small probability, there's gonna be a ramp angle that makes me stop. And that's ex that even happened at the end of the video, right? This video actually ends when the, the ramp, there was a bunch of sort of pretty level things. This one, oh, it got started again. Okay, but at some point, with some probability, you get unlucky and you stop, right? And then once you stop, you're never coming back. Okay, so the stationary distribution of the rimless wheel on rough terrain has all of its probability mass at the stopped fixed point. But it has a long living metastable distribution you know, that's around the rolling fixed point, exactly like what we talked about. Right? And I think that's actually, that's sort of a reasonable model of what walking robots, we could expect for our walking robots. The student who did this, Katie, was incredibly good at MATLAB plotting. So let me show you her artistry in just a second. Okay, here we go, look at this. This is the re return map being built up by random visits. Woo, look at that. Yeah, pretty good. Anyways, so we did a lot of work understanding the sort of metastable distributions of the, of the rimless wheel on rough terrain. Okay, that's the high level overview of what the stochastic dynamics can do. And basically, you know, nonlinear dynamics were already cool. They could do finite escape. They could converge in finite time. They can do all kinds of crazy things. They can be chaotic. Okay, now you put probabilities in there and you get all, all kinds of beautiful stuff out. 
And let me just sort of forecast where we're going with in terms of control. So once once you have these stochastic models, then that changes the question you might ask for control. I already alluded to the fact that it changes possibly the optimization landscape for control. But, I mean, this is kind of what everybody's been asking here, but there's maybe a few broad approaches. To control, okay? So one of them would be Let's avoid some of these long tail issues and think about bounded disturbances. And then you try to give like worst case analysis, you know, guarantees with probability one. We did that already a little bit with common Lyapunov functions. But there are many more tools in that toolbox. People often say that um, robust control is all about worst case analysis and it's too conservative because of that, but actually that's not really true. Robust control often has other notions of, of robustness, <coughs> which for instance, a really good one from robust control would be to try to think about um, input-output gains. This goes farthest with linear systems, but you can say, for instance, if I take my, my inputs, and say I've got U, I've got my Y, maybe I've got a control system, feedback controller, Okay, what I want to think about is the total, let me draw it again here. I want to think about the total W to some performance of my closed loop system. And we'll, we'll show you ways to think of, say, you know, W might not, it might be that Z doesn't go to zero absolutely, but what you'd like to say is that the distributions that you get in Z are proportional to the magnitude of the distribution that you get in W. So if W is zero, you'd like Z to get to zero, but if W is, is very high energy, then you'd expect Z to be proportionally uh, higher energy. But if you can bound the gain from omega, or from W to, to Z, then you can say something about, about the gain of a closed loop system and things like that. Okay, so robust control via input-output gains is a second big approach. And then I would say the, the you know, maybe the most common these days with RL uh, in the, the, the center stage would be uh, average cost control. Maybe most things that are just called stochastic optimal control would fall under that, but also reinforcement learning is almost always that. Not, all, not exclusively, but. Where you try to optimize the expected value. Okay. And Making different choices there gives, leads to very different algorithms. Some of them, like you say, like worst case can be too conservative. You might be that you can't, we should, we'll never have a guarantee that an autonomous car is absolutely with probability one guaranteed to be successful. And so maybe some of these other definitions are needed. Okay, they're, they're appealing when you can get them, when you can actually certify your model. All right, so we'll dive into those, some, some examples of the algorithms that people use for each of these in the next couple lectures. Good, okay.